But when we uh, settled on the title for this talk some time ago, a uh, few would have guessed how apt it would be uh, when the time came, uh, that is, how dramatically the world would be changing and how far-reaching are the uh, implications and consequences for domestic and world order. Uh, the democracy uprising in the Arab world uh, has been a spectacular display of uh, courage, uh, dedication, and commitment to, uh, by popular forces. Uh, it uh, coincided fortuitously uh, with a remarkable uprising, also unexpected, uh, of tens of thousands of people in uh, support of working people and democracy in uh, uh, Madison, Wisconsin and uh, other U.S. cities. In fact, one telling event occurred on February 20th when Kamal Abbas uh, sent a message from Tahrir Square in Cairo to Wisconsin workers saying, we stand with you as you stood with us. Uh, Abbas is uh, a leading figure in the, uh, has been in the many years of struggle uh, of Egyptian workers for uh, elementary rights. What's happened since January 21st, did, 5th, did not come out of nowhere. In fact, the uh, uh, April 6th movement, which organized it, the movement of young people, tech-savvy young people, that took its name April 6th from a, a, a major strike action, a support action in the uh, uh, big industrial center, textile industrial center of uh, Egypt Mahala Center a couple of years ago. Now, that was crushed by force, but it was April 6th, and that gives the name for the movement that erupted unexpectedly even to the organizers on January 25th. Uh, he, uh, uh, Abbas's message of solidarity uh, evoked uh, the traditional uh, aspiration of uh, labor movements worldwide for uh, solidarity among the workers of the world and among populations generally. Well, however uh, flawed their record, uh, labor movements have regularly been in the forefront of popular struggles for uh, both basic rights, uh, including labor rights and uh, democracy generally. Uh, in Tahrir Square, in the streets of Madison, and many other places, the popular struggles underway right now uh, reach quite directly to the prospects for authentic democracy. Uh, that means socio-political systems in which uh, people are free and equal participants uh, in controlling the institutions in which they live and work. And I stress participants and not mere spectators. Uh, that's the way democratic theory uh, has insisted uh, is their function, as it's called, the function of the public, uh, the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, to quote uh, Walter Lippmann, the most prominent 20th century uh, American public intellectual, uh, Wilson Roosevelt progressive. Uh, these are in his uh, highly regarded uh, progressive uh, essays on democracy, and he was articulating a standard view, which actually traces back to the founders of the U.S. Constitution and is upheld, of course, in much harsher forms elsewhere. Uh, right now, the trajectories in Cairo and Madison are intersecting in a way, but they're headed in opposite directions. In Cairo, they're headed towards eliminating uh, towards gaining uh, basic rights uh, that had been denied by the Western-backed dictatorships. Uh, in Madison, they're heading towards uh, trying to defend uh, rights that had been won in long and hard struggles and are now under serious attack. Uh, there are sure to be far-ranging consequences of what's taking place uh, both in uh, the decaying industrial heartland of the richest and most powerful country in the world, uh, in human history, in fact, and in what uh, President Eisenhower called the most strategically important area of the world, a stupendous source of strategic power, uh, 
and probably the richest economic prize in the world in the, in the field of foreign investment. Now, those are the words of the State Department in the 1940s. That was a prize, of course, that the US intended to keep for itself and for its allies in the unfolding uh, new world order that was emerging from the ruins of the Second World War. Uh, the, uh, there have been plenty of changes since, but despite, despite all these dramatic changes, there's every reason to suspect, suppose, that today's policymakers basically adopt the same perspective. Uh, they undoubtedly still adhere to the judgment of uh, uh, one of the most more influential uh, advisors of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, A. A. Burley, in his words, that control of the incomparable energy reserves of the Middle East would yield substantial control of the world. And correspondingly, uh, loss of control would threaten the project of global dominance that was uh, clearly articulated during World War II by high-level planners and that has been sustained uh, in the face of uh, major changes in world order uh, uh, since that day. Uh, these common understanding is, as is quite often the case, articulated most uh, frankly and clearly in the business press in the US and the Wall Street Journal, where their <coughs> leading political correspondent, Gerald Seib, uh, uh, commented a couple of days ago that there's a big problem in the Middle East. We have not yet learned how to control the new forces that are emerging. Uh, the assumption is, well, of course, we have to control them. That's our right and our duty, but we have to learn how. Uh, from the uh, outset of the war, Second World War in 1939, uh, Washington anticipated that, it, that the war would end with the United States in a position of overwhelming power. Uh, High-level State Department officials and uh, non-governmental foreign uh, policy specialists uh, met regularly through the uh, wartime years. Uh, they laid out plans for the post-war world. Uh, they delineated what they called a grand area that the U.S. was to dominate. Uh, the grand area was to include at least the Western Hemisphere, uh, the entire Far East, and the uh, British Empire, which the U.S. was planning to take over, uh, including the U.S. Uh, uh, Middle East energy resources. Uh, the British Foreign Office was aware of this. If you look at their documents, not very happy about it, but they said <laughs> we're going to have to recognize that we're going to be a junior partner, as they called it, in the evolving wor world order. Uh, the, uh, well, that was in the early years of the, of the war. As uh, Russian forces started to grind down the Nazi armies after Stalingrad, uh, the conception of the grand area was enlarged uh, to include as much of Eurasia as possible, including certainly the uh, industrial and commercial center, the heartland of uh, uh, Western Europe. Now, within the grand area, I'm now quoting, within the grand area, the US was to maintain unquestioned power with military and economic supremacy while ensuring the limitation of any exercise of sovereignty by states that might interfere with its global designs. That's a live policy right now. I'll come back to crucial instances. One should bear in mind how venerable the doctrine is and how appropriate to the nature of the world that was in fact emerging. You have to remember that when the Second World War ended, the US literally had half the world's wealth, a position of power, of security that was totally unparalleled, uh, nothing like it in history, and that was understood. It's quite clear from the documentary record, I'm quoting now, that President Roosevelt was aiming at United States hegemony in the post-war world. That's quoting the British diplomatic historian Jeffrey Warner, quite an accurate assessment. And more significant, the careful wartime plans were uh, implemented uh, uh, in very much the terms uh, in which they were outlined during the war. They were implemented shortly after. 
Well, it was always recognized from the beginning that uh, Europe might choose to follow an independent path. Uh, NATO was partially intended to counter this threat. And uh, rather strikingly, as soon as the official pretext for NATO, you know, protecting Europe from the Russian hordes, as soon as that dissolved in uh, 1989, uh, reflexively, NATO was expanded. If anyone had believed the propaganda, it should have disappeared. Instead, it expanded. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened in 1989 is that a lot of clouds lifted. And you could sort of see policy less concealed by ideology. So NATO was expanded to the east. Now, that was in violation of uh, verbal pledges to Gorbachev, which he was naive enough to believe. Uh, he was pretty irritated by it, but nothing he could do. And it's uh, since been expanded beyond. Uh, now it's a US-run global intervention force. And it has an official task. The official task is controlling the crucial infrastructure of the global energy system. That's quite an expansive role. And uh, that's what NATO is now committed to. Uh, the Grand Area Doctrine uh, limits uh, the sovereignty of others explicitly, but it grants the United States uh, unrestricted rights. That's what it means to be a global hegemon. And that was made very clear and explicit at once. Uh, for example, in 1946, uh, when the US uh, agreed to uh, world court jurisdiction, uh, but with a condition. The condition was that the United States would not be subject to any international treaties, meaning the UN Charter, the Charter of the Organization of American States, uh, uh, later the Genocide Convention, and so on. Uh, that, uh, th this has come up before the court repeatedly, and the court has accepted, um, as it was required to do, the reservation that uh, none of these uh, treaties apply to the United States. Uh, the uh, principles also clearly license uh, military intervention at will. And that conclusion has been clearly not, not only implemented con continuously, but also pretty clearly articulated. And one tends to think of uh, the right-wing administrations, but that's misleading. Uh, one of the most expansive uh, forms of the doctrine was under Clinton, in fact, Bill Clinton. The Clinton administration declared, quote, that the United States has the right to use military force unilaterally to ensure uninhibited access to key markets, energy supplies, and strategic resources, and must maintain military forces forward deployed in Europe and Asia in order to shape people's opinions about us and to shape events that will affect our livelihood and our security. That's actually much more expansive than the uh, much maligned uh, George W. Bush doctrine that came later. Uh, uh, the Clinton doctrine doesn't even require the pretexts that the Bush doctrine insisted on. But it was presented politely, so therefore it didn't <laughs> uh, arouse much uh, interest. Actually, the, the, the antagonism towards Bush was almost entirely style, not substance. The substance is pretty standard. Uh, the, uh, I think that's one of the reasons Obama was so welcomed in Europe. The style changed, not the substance. But, uh, uh, the same principles uh, uh, governed the invasion of Iraq. Uh, that became clearer as uh, uh, US failure to uh, impose its, uh, its will became uh, clearer at that, as that proceeded, the actual goals of the invasion couldn't be concealed any longer behind uh, pretty rhetoric about you know democracy and all sorts of nice things. Uh, in November 2007, the White House issued uh, what it called a Declaration of Principles concerning Iraq. Uh, two main points: one was that U.S. forces must remain indefinitely in Iraq big military bases, right to carry out combat operations. And uh, secondly, that Iraq must privilege US investors. Uh, two months later, January 2008, uh, President Bush 
uh, informed Congress that he would reject legislation that might limit the permanent stationing of U.S. armed forces in Iraq or U.S. control of the oil resources of Iraq, I'm quoting. Uh, the, uh, uh, these are demands, incidentally, that the United States had to abandon shortly after in the face of Iraqi resistance as it had been forced to back off step by step all the way through. That's a major triumph of nonviolent resistance. Now, the US and Britain have no trouble at all killing insurgents. They're very good at killing people. But they couldn't deal with the mass nonviolent resistance, the hundreds of thousands of people uh, demonstrating and protesting. So they had to back off. And finally, the basic war aims were abandoned, articulated pretty clearly as they were being abandoned. Uh, that's uh, a major defeat, as uh, Jonathan Steele and other serious analysts have recognized. Uh, in uh, Tunisia and Egypt today, the popular uprising has uh, scored quite impressive victories. But uh, as the Carnegie Endowment reported a few days ago, its research group, uh, while names have changed, the uh, regimes remain. Uh, the, uh, as they point out, a change in ruling elites and the system of governance is still a distant goal. Maybe it'll be achieved, maybe not, but it's not going to be easy. Uh, the report uh, discusses a variety of internal barriers to such changes to democracy, but it ignores, as usual, the external barriers, uh, which as always are quite significant. Uh, the United States and its Western allies are sure to do whatever they can to prevent authentic democracy in the Arab world. And there are very simple reasons for that. Uh, to understand why, it's only necessary to look at the studies of Arab opinion, which are conducted by um, uh, the most prestigious US polling agencies, uh, released by major institutions like the Brookings Institution. Uh, they reveal that by overwhelming majorities, uh, Arabs regard the U.S. and Israel as the major threats they face. Uh, the United St in Egypt, uh, the United States is regarded as the major threat by 90% of Egyptians uh, in the region generally, not much less than that. Uh, some regard Iran as a threat, 10%. Uh, opposition to U.S. policy is so strong that a majority uh, believe that the region would be, that security would be improved for the region if Iran had nuclear weapons. In Egypt, that's uh, 80%. Uh, other figures are similar. Uh, if public opinion were to influence policy, uh, the United States would not only not control the region, but it would be expelled from it, uh, Britain as well, uh, along with its allies. Now, that would undermine fundamental principles of uh, global domination that have been operative in their current form since the Second World War and as far as Britain's concerned back long before that. Uh, in general, uh, support for democracy is the province of ideologists and propagandists uh, in the real world as the more serious scholarship has conceded. The US and its allies support democracy if and only if it corresponds to strategic and economic objectives. Actually, Stalin could have said the same thing. Uh, uh, elite contempt for democracy was revealed very dramatically in the uh, reaction to the recent uh, WikiLeaks exposures. Uh, the ones that received the most attention with uh, euphoric commentary uh, were the cables that reported uh, that Arabs support the U.S. stand on Iran, really important. Now, the reference was reflexively to the ruling dictators. Now, the attitudes of the public were unmentioned. Uh, the uh, guiding principle behind this, apart from the obvious contempt for democracy on the part of the general intellectual community, uh, the guiding principle was articulated quite clearly by a Carnegie Endowment Middle East specialist, Marwan Muasher, he's formerly a high official of the Jordanian dictatorship. Uh, the principle is there's nothing wrong 
everything is under control. Uh, in short, as long as the dictators support us, uh, what else could matter? Uh, the Muasher doctrine is uh, rational and venerable. Uh, to mention just one case that's highly relevant today, and my opinion ought to be in the front pages, uh, in 1958, uh, President Eisenhower expressed an internal discussion, since declassified, uh, uh, he uh, expressed a concern about what he called the campaign of hatred against us uh, in the Arab world, uh, not by governments, but by the people. Uh, the National Security Council explained at the same time uh, the reasons for it. This is the highest planning body. Uh, they said there's a perception in the Arab world that the United States supports uh, dictatorships and blocks democracy and development uh, and that uh, we do that so as to ensure control over uh, the resources of the region. And furthermore, they went on to say that the perception is basically accurate and uh, that that's exactly what we should be doing, relying on the Muasher doctrine. As long as people are quiet, everything's under control, it's fine. Uh, the, uh, after 9-11, uh, there were internal government studies, US government studies, uh, which confirmed uh, that the same is true. They uh, responded to George W. Bush's plaintive uh, plea that they hate our freedoms. And they concluded that no, they don't hate our freedoms, uh, they hate our policies, and with good reason, the same reason they did in the 1950s. Actually, 1958 was a particularly interesting moment because that was just two years after uh, Eisenhower had expelled uh, Britain France and Israel from Egyptian territory, and not incidentally because he disapproved of the invasion, thought that was okay, uh, but the timing was bad. It interfered with a US planned coup in Syria, and he didn't like the disobedience. Uh, Britain, France, and Israel are supposed to understand who's boss, and not to carry out operations like this without informing the master. So they were summarily expelled. And uh, you might have guessed that our public opinion would be favorable to the US after this, but uh, they perceive things a little more deeply than Western ideologists. So yes, there was a campaign of hatred for the reasons that the NSC, National Security Council, uh, articulated. Uh, the current polls, which I mentioned, indicate that how little uh, anything has changed in this regard, not at all, in fact. Well, it's, uh, if we look back a little farther to history, there are some lessons there, too. It's quite normal for the victors to uh, regard history as bunk, you know, consign it to the trash can. Who cares? Let's look ahead. It's also quite normal for the victims to take history seriously for pretty good reasons. Uh, and they just make a few observations. It's a very important matter. I'll just barely touch it, but it can be useful to think about it a little. Uh, today is actually not the first occasion when uh, Egypt and uh, the United States are in somewhat uh, uh, similar situations. Uh, the, uh, that was er also true in the early part of the 19th century. Uh, economic historians have argued that, in that at that time, say around 1830, uh, Egypt was uh, well placed to undertake rapid economic development about the same time the US was beginning to do so. Uh, both Egypt and the US had uh, rich agriculture. Uh, that included cotton, which is sort of the oil of the 19th century, the fuel of the early Industrial Revolution, uh, though there was a difference. Uh, unlike Egypt, uh, the United States <clears throat> had to develop cotton production uh, and a workforce uh, by conquest, uh, extermination, and slavery, uh, the consequences are still very much alive. Uh, all you have to do is take a look at the reservations for the survivors of the extermination program and also at the prisons that have expanded very rapidly since the uh, Reagan years and far beyond any other country. Uh, and they're needed. they're needed to house the superfluous population uh, left over by deindustrialization. There's a pretty close race class correlation, so it ends up being largely black, to some extent Hispanic. Uh, 
Now, there was, however, one fundamental difference between Egypt and the United States at that time. Uh, the United States had gained independence, and it was therefore free uh, to ignore the prescriptions of economic theory. They were delivered at the time by Adam Smith uh, in terms uh, quite similar to those that are prescribed for sometimes for the so-called developing societies today. Uh, Smith, right away, urged the, uh, right at the time of the War of Independence, uh, he urged the liberated colonies to produce primary products for export and to import superior British manufacturers, and certainly not to monopolize crucial goods, like particularly cotton. Uh, any other path, he said, would retard instead of accelerating the further increase in the value of their annual produce and would obstruct instead of promoting the progress of their country towards real wealth and greatness. Familiar words expressed a little less, less elegantly today, but same, same, same prescriptions. Well, the colonies had gained their independence, and so therefore they were free to ignore the principles of sound economics and they were able to follow England's own course of uh, state-guided uh, independent development. This was, in fact, the case. Uh, and so the colonies right away imposed a high, very high tariffs to uh, protect industry from superior British exports, at first textiles, later steel, and others, and a range of other devices to uh, accelerate economic development. Uh, the independent republic uh, also proceeded to try to gain a monopoly of cotton. Uh, that was the uh, primary goal behind the conquest of Texas and conquest of half of Mexico. And the goal was quite explicit. The Jacksonian presidents explained that uh, if the United States could gain a monopoly of cotton, we could place all other nations at our feet. Uh, particularly the British enemy, which was the main impediment to expansion. That's why Canada is still technically free, though becoming slowly incorporated by other means. Uh, the, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, for Egypt, on the other hand, a comparable course was barred by British power. Uh, Lord Palmerston declared that uh, no ideas of fairness towards Egypt ought to stand in the way of such great and paramount interests of Britain as preserving its economic and political hegemony. He also expressed uh, what he called his hate for the ignorant barbarian, Muhammad Ali, modernizing leader, who dared to seek an independent course. And uh, uh, Britain was able to deploy uh, its fleet and its financial power to terminate uh, Egypt's quest for independence and economic development. Uh, it's policies like these, incidentally, that are substantially responsible for the divide that developed between what we call the first and the third world. They were not very different in that period. Uh, after World War II, the United States replaced uh, Britain as global hegemon, and the United States adopted exactly the same stand. Uh, the US made it clear that it would provide no aid to Egypt unless Egypt adhered to the standard rules for the week, Adam Smith's prescriptions, IMF World Bank prescriptions. Uh, the US, of course, continued to violate them, but that's according to the regular principles as well. So the US uh, imposed high, tariff, high tariffs on Egyptian cotton to protect US cotton production, uh, and it uh, led to a terrible dollar shortage in Egypt. Uh, that's the usual interpretation of market principles going back centuries. Uh, market principles are kind of like democracy. You appeal to them when they're useful, but disregard them when they're harmful. Uh, so it's uh, not too surprising that uh, to see the campaign of hatred against the United States that concerned Eisenhower uh, over 50 years ago uh, based on the recognition that uh, the United States, like Britain, France, others with the power to do so, uh, the United States supports dictators 
uh, blocks democracy and development, uh, and does so for quite understandable reasons. Uh, in Adam Smith's defense, I should mention that he recognized what would happen to Britain if it adhered to the rules of sound economics. Uh, so there's what's now more or less called neoliberalism. Uh, he warned that if British manufacturers, merchants, and investors turned abroad, they might profit, but England would suffer. However, he felt that uh, they would be guided by uh, what's sometimes called a home bias. They'd prefer the home country. So as if by an invisible hand, England would be spared the ravages of uh, classical, uh, of econo what's called economic rationality. Actually, that passage in Wealth of Nations is pretty hard to miss. It's the only passage in which the famous phrase invisible hands appears in a critique of what we now call neoliberalism and a warning against it. Uh, the other leading founder of uh, classical economics, David Ricardo, uh, he drew pretty similar conclusions. He explained that he hoped that home bias would, I'm quoting him now, would lead men of property to be satisfied with the low rate of profits in their own country rather than seek a more advantageous employment for their wealth in foreign nations. He's speaking of England, of course, and he said these are feelings that I would be sorry to see weakened uh, putting aside their predictions, the instincts of the classical economists were quite sound. Uh, well, going back to coming back to today, the democracy uprisings in the Arab world are uh, pretty commonly compared to Eastern Europe in 1989, but that's a rather dubious comparison. Uh, in 1989, the democracy uprising was supported by Western powers in accord with the standard doctrine that democracy is fine if it uh, satisfies uh, strategic and economic interests. Uh, furthermore, uh, the democracy uprisings were tolerated by the dominant power in the region, by Russia, uh, almost exactly the opposite of what's happening now. There's no Gorbachev in the West, quite the contrary, and Western power remains uh, hostile to democracy in the Arab world uh, for quite sound reasons, those that I mentioned. Uh, so a more relevant comparison, and one which is never drawn, uh, but I think it is more relevant, would be to events that were taking place in US domains at exactly the same time, 1989. So for example, a few days after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, an elite uh, Salvadoran battalion he was fresh from renewed training in the John F. Kennedy School of uh, Special Warfare in North Carolina, uh, invaded the uh, Jesuit University in El Salvador and uh, brutally uh, murdered six leading Latin American intellectuals, uh, Jesuit priests, along with their housekeeper and their daughter, uh, all under orders of the uh, uh, government, which was very closely linked to the United States. Uh, following direct orders. Uh, that uh, culminated a decade of uh, horrors in which began when the archbishop, who was called the voice for the voiceless, uh, was assassinated by much the same hands. Uh, during that period, about 70,000 people were killed uh, in uh, El Salvador, uh, overwhelmingly by the US armed and trained forces. About twice that number were killed uh, elsewhere in Central America in the same years, same source. Uh, the primary targets were the people's organizations fighting to defend their most fundamental human rights. Those are the words of the assassinated archbishop uh, days before he was killed while saying mass, pleading in vain in a letter to Jimmy Carter, uh, pleading for the end of U.S. military aid to the murderous uh, uh, junta. Uh, to serious scholarship in the West, and of course to the victims, it's well known, I'm quoting now, that between 1960 and the Soviet collapse in 1990, the number of political prisoners, uh, torture victims, and executions of nonviolent political dissenters in Latin America vastly exceeded those in the Soviet Union and East European satellites, and I can add, of course, the 
hundreds of thousands of people who were simply slaughtered. Uh, all of this supported or tolerated by Washington included many religious martyrs, uh, such as those who framed the horrible decade in El Salvador, uh, and uh, mass slaughter as well. Well, actually, I'm quoting well-known Latin Americanist John Coatsworth in the uh, recently published Cambridge History of the Cold War. Uh, Coatsworth picks the year 1960 for good reasons. Now, there had been, of course, uh, many similar horrors in earlier years, but the U.S. crusade against democracy and human rights in the Western Hemisphere uh, escalated very sharply right at that time, uh, right after Vatican II in 1962. And 19, that was a historic event. In the words of uh, distinguished theologian Hans Kung, it ushered in a new era in the history of the Catholic Church. Uh, the, uh, it was an effort to restore the Christianity of the Gospels uh, that had been what Christianity was in its first few centuries, which is why Christians were persecuted, but ended when the Roman Empire took it over and turned it into the church of, uh, of the persecutors, not the persecuted in the fourth century. Uh, so this was an attempt to restore the Christianity of the Gospels, and uh, inspired by that, uh, Latin American bishops uh, uh, adopted what they called the preferential option for the poor. Uh, priests, nuns, laypersons uh, tried to take the radical pacifist uh, message of the Gospels to uh, the poor and the persecuted uh, of the hemisphere, people who were, and uh, 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 tried to organize them in what were called base communities. Uh, and uh, uh, urged them, tried to help them take their fate in their own hands and work together to overcome the misery of survival in the harsh realms of uh, U.S. power. Uh, this was recognized at once to be an intolerable heresy, and the reaction was very swift. The Kennedy administration immediately helped install a vicious uh, national security state in Brazil, plague then spread throughout the continent in ways which should be familiar. It uh, culminated exactly when the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, these events have uh, been uh, disappeared, to borrow the terminology used in Latin America. Uh, they suffer from a fallacy, the fallacy of wrong agency, that we carried them out. Therefore, they cannot be in history. And uh, you don't study them in school, you don't read about them, people don't write about them, and so on. And we write about our nobility in supporting the uh, Eastern European dissidents, who surely suffered, but not even remotely like what was going on in our own domains. Uh, and I should add that horrible as these events were, uh, they're barely a pea on a mountain as compared with other crimes in that period. Uh, notably the Indochina Wars that uh, followed from Kennedy's invasion of South Vietnam almost exactly 50 years ago. Uh, it's also been disappeared for the same reasons, fallacy of wrong agency. Uh, a careful look reveals that the grand area doctrines continue to apply to contemporary crises. Uh, let's take what's considered the main one. In Western policymaking circles and uh, among political commentators, uh, the Iranian threat is considered to pose the greatest danger to world order and hence must be the primary focus of uh, U.S. foreign policy. Europe's trailing along politely as usual. Uh, this year is called the Year of Iran because of the danger of that enormous threat, uh, which does raise a question. What exactly is the Iranian threat? Uh, if you read the public commentary, you don't get much of an answer. But there actually is an authoritative answer, uh, which is ignored. Uh, the authoritative answer is provided by the regular reports to Congress by the Pentagon and U.S. intelligence agencies come every year, reports on uh, the global, global security. And of course, they include a section on Iran. Most recent was uh, almost a year ago. Uh, the Reports make it very clear that whatever the Iranian threat is, it's not military. It's all, quote, uh, 
Iran's uh, military spending is relatively low compared to the rest of the region. In fact, it's less than a quarter of that of Saudi Arabia, and minuscule as compared with the US, of course. Uh, it's uh, Iran's military doctrine is strictly defensive, uh, designed to slow an invasion and to force a diplomatic solution to hostilities. Iran has only limited capacity to project force beyond its borders. They, of course, bring up the nuclear option and say that uh, Iran's nuclear program and its willingness to keep open the possibility of developing nuclear weapons is a central part of its uh, deterrent strategy. Well, the brutal clerical regime in Iran is undoubtedly a major threat to its own people, though it hardly outranks US allies in that regard. Uh, but the threat lies elsewhere, and it's ominous. One element of the threat is Iran's potential deterrent capacity. Notice that that's an illegitimate exercise of sovereignty because it might interfere with US freedom of action in the region. And it's, of course, glaringly obvious why Iran would seek a deterrent capacity. Just take a look at the disposition of forces in the region, including nuclear forces. Uh, seven years ago, one of Israel's leading military historians, Martin von Krefeld, wrote that the world has witnessed how the United States attacked Iraq for, as it turned out, no reason at all. Uh, had the Iranians not tried to build nuclear weapons, they would be crazy. Uh, particularly when they're under constant threat uh, by uh, uh, constant threat of attack by the United States, of course, in violation of the UN Charter, but remember that that doesn't apply to the United States. Whether they are, in fact, developing a nuclear capability, we don't really know, but uh, perhaps so. Well, the Iranian threat, as described in the documents and the reports, goes beyond deterrence. Uh, Iran is also seeking to expand its influence in neighboring countries and thus uh, to, to uh, destabilize uh, the region, as it's called. Uh, notice that when the U.S. Invade and uh, invades and occupies Ir Iran's neighbors, uh, that's stabilization. Uh, when Iran tries to expand its influence, say, commercial relations, with its neighbors, that's destabilization. That is absolutely routine usage in foreign policy commentary. So for sometimes it becomes almost comical. Here's a, a prominent foreign policy analyst, James Chase, former editor of foreign affairs, rather on the liberal side, incidentally. Uh, he was properly using the term stability in its technical sense when he explained that in order to achieve stability in Chile, it was necessary to destabilize the country, uh, namely by overthrowing the elected Allende government, installing a vicious dictatorship. Sounds contradictory, but it isn't if you understand the technical meaning of the terms. Uh, well, other concerns about Iran, I no time to go into. They're interesting to explore, uh, but I think they simply show it underscore what the guiding doctrines are and their, their continuing status in imperial culture. And that's very much in accord with the doctrines that were laid down by uh, FDR's planners back in, during the uh, Second World War. Uh, the United States cannot tolerate any exercise of sovereignty that interferes with its global designs. And uh, the United States and Europe are, of course, engaged in punishing Iran for its threat to stability and trying to get it to become a more civilized country. Uh, but it's useful to recall how isolated the US and Europe are. Uh, the non-aligned countries, which is most of the world, uh, they have uh, for years been vigorously supporting Iran's uh, right to enrich uranium. Uh, within the region, as I mentioned, uh, the irrelevant public uh, even strongly favors Iranian nuclear weapons. Uh, the major regional power, Turkey, voted against the latest U.S. sanctions motion in the Security Council, along with Brazil, uh, which is the most admired country of the South, as polls show. Uh, 
Turkey's disobedience led to sharp censure at that point, but not for the first time. Uh, Turkey was bitterly condemned in 2003 when the government committed a major crime. It followed the will of 95% of the population and refused to take part in the US-British invasion of Iraq. And uh, that demonstrated its very weak grasp of democracy, which led to <laughs> sanctions and uh, sharp censure. Uh, same today, after the 2010 Security Council misdeed, uh, Turkey was warned by Obama's top diplomat on European affairs, Philip Gordon, that it must demonstrate its, com its commitment to partnership with the West, follow orders in other words. Uh, a scholar with the Council on Foreign Relations asked, uh, how do we keep the Turks in their lane? They're departing, you know, something wrong. Uh, in their lane means following orders like good Democrats, our style Democrats. Uh, Brazil's uh, Lula it was admonished in a New York Times uh, headline. Uh, he uh, was warned that his effort with Turkey to provide a solution to the uranium enrichment issue outside the framework of US power is a spot on the Brazilian leader's legacy. In brief, do what we say. That's your function. It's kind of an interesting sidelight to all of this, which has been effectively suppressed. Uh, the Iran-Turkey-Brazil deal had been approved in advance by President Obama, uh, presumably on the assumption that uh, it wouldn't fail and that would provide an ideological weapon against Iran. Uh, that was revealed by the British Foreign Office, which released the letter of support for it after Brazil was censured. Uh, when the uh, effort succeeded, uh, uh, approval quickly turned to censure, and Washington rammed through a Security Council uh, resolution, which was so weak that China readily signed, and is now chastised uh, for living up to the letter of the resolution, but not following Washington's unilateral directives, which go far beyond it. That's the current issue of Foreign Affairs, the main establishment of Foreign Affairs Journal. Well, while the US can tolerate Turkish disobedience, though with dismay, China's harder to ignore. So the press, New York Times, warns that uh, China's investors and traders are now filling a vacuum in Iran as businesses from many other nations, especially in Europe, pull out in fear of the United States. Uh, and in particular, it's expanding its dominant role in Iran's uh, energy industries. All of this is quite in accord with the UN resolutions, but inconsistent with the more extreme US demands, which have no legal authorization other than what's granted by power. Uh, the, it's, it's interesting to watch the Washington reactions, reacting with a, a touch of desperation. So the State Department warned China that if it wants to be accepted in the international community, that's incidentally another technical term that refers to the US and whoever happens to agree with it at the moment, uh, if China wants to be accepted in the international community, it must not skirt, skirt and evade international responsibilities, which are clear, namely follow US orders. Uh, China, unlikely to be impressed, I suspect this led to some amusement in the Chinese foreign offices. Uh, there's also a lot of concern about the growing Chinese military threat. A uh, Pentagon study that recently came out warned that China's military budget is now approaching one-fifth of what the Pentagon spends to operate and carry out the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's, of course, a small fraction of the US military budget. Uh, China's expansion of uh, military forces, it points out, might deny the ability of American warships to operate in international waters off its coast, uh, off its coast, China's coast. It's yet to be, uh, I haven't come across a proposal that, uh, uh, that, uh, that the US uh, might 
uh, eliminate military forces that would deny uh, the ability of Chinese warships to operate in the Caribbean. Of course, this fundamental asymmetry. Uh, China's lack of understanding of the rules of international civility uh, is illustrated further by its uh, objections to US plans uh, to uh, send the advanced aircraft carrier, uh, George Washington, to take part in joint naval operations a few miles off China's coast, apparently, allegedly, with capacity to strike uh, uh, Be Beijing with uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, in contrast, the U.S. understands that such operations are undertaken to defend stability and U.S. security. And this is discussed in the strategic analysis literature. It's pointed out that uh, this is what, what they call a classic security dilemma. Uh, each side sees vital interests at stake off the coast of China. Uh, the liberal New Republic expresses its concern about the hardliners who now run China's foreign policy. And the most severe charge is that China sent 10 warships through international waters uh, just off the Japanese island of Okinawa, while Chinese naval helicopters flew dangerously close to Japanese ships. And that is indeed a provocation, uh, unlike the fact unmentioned uh, that Washington has converted the island into a major US military base uh, in defiance of uh, uh, ve vehement protests by the people of Okinawa who are as irrelevant as the people of the Arab world. Now, that's not a provocation by the standard principle that we own the world. Uh, well, putting aside deep-seated imperial doctrine, uh, there's good reason for China's neighbors to be concerned about its growing military and commercial power. And although Arab public opinion supports a, an Iranian nuclear weapons program, uh, I don't think we should do so. Actually, the foreign policy literature is full of proposals as to how to counter the threat of an Iranian uh, nuclear program. Uh, one obvious way to do so is not discussed, uh, namely work to establish a nuclear weapons-free zone in the region. Now, that issue has arisen repeatedly. Uh, it arose again at the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference last May. Uh, uh, Egypt, which was chair of the non-aligned countries, in their name, uh, it proposed that the conference call for negotiations on a Middle East nuclear weapons-free zone, as indeed had been agreed by the West, including the US, at the 1995 review conference. Nothing had been done. Actually, international support for this is so overwhelming that President Obama was compelled to agree formally uh, while uh, insisting that this is not the right time and insisting that Israel be exempted. And of course, the US, which is self-exempted from international obligations, as I already mentioned. Uh, so uh, Washington informed the conference that it's got a nice idea, but not now. It has to wait for a comprehensive peace settlement. And furthermore, no proposal can call for Israel's nuclear programs to be placed under the auspices of the uh, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency or, for, call for, or can call for release of information about Israeli nuclear facilities and activities. Uh, other than these conditions, it's a fine idea. It's uh, rarely noted that uh, the United States and Britain have a very special responsibility to work to establish a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. When the US and Britain tried to concoct a thin legal cover for the invasion of Iraq, they appealed to a Security Council resolution, Resolution 687 in 1991, uh, which called on Iraq to terminate its uh, development of uh, weapons of mass destruction. Well, we can put aside the claim, uh, but the resolution does commit its signers, the US and Britain, uh, to work to establish a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. So the US and Britain have a special, unique responsibility for this. Uh, parenthetically, parenthetically, we can add that US insistence 
on maintaining nuclear facilities in Diego Garcia uh, undermines another nuclear weapons free zone, the African one. They regard that as part of Africa. Uh, Diego Garcia, as you should know, is a particularly important case. Uh, Britain obediently followed orders and expelled the population from the island so that the United States could set up a major military base, which is used, in fact, it's used for bombing the Middle East and Central Asia. It's been expanded under Obama to accommodate nuclear submarines and also uh, deep penetration bombs uh, aimed at Iran. Now, that's a program that languished under Bush, but was taken up with enthusiasm as soon as uh, uh, Obama took office and has been considerably accelerated. Well, while ground area doctrine still prevails, the capacity to implement it has declined. Now, the peak of US power was after World War II, when, as I said, the US had literally half the world's wealth. That naturally declined. Uh, other industrial countries reconstructed uh, from the devastation of the war. Decolonization took its rather agonizing course. And by the early 1970s, the US share of global wealth had declined uh, to about 25%, still huge, but not half. Uh, the industrial world had become what was called tripolar, uh, US-based North America, uh, Europe, uh, East Asia, then Japan-based. There was also a very sharp change in the US economy in the 1970s, namely towards uh, financialization and uh, export of production. No time to go into the details, but they're very significant. Uh, what happened is that a variety of factors converged to create a vicious cycle uh, of uh, radical concentration of wealth, uh, mostly in a top fraction of 1% of the population. It's a very small, huge concentration. That means mostly uh, CEOs, um, hedge fund managers, and so on. That's the real source of the tremendous uh, uh, inequality in the United States. It's like a tenth of a percent of the population has an enormous impact on this. Uh, that uh, carries with it concentration of political power. Uh, and that, in turn, uh, leads to development of state policies to increase the concentration. It includes fiscal policies, tax policies designed to that end, uh, rules of corporate governance, uh, deregulation, uh, a lot more. Uh, meanwhile, the same years, the cost of elections skyrocketed, and that has an effect. It drives both political parties much deeper into the pockets of concentrated capital. Uh, it's increasingly financial capital. Now, the Republicans, for them, it's reflexive. The Democrats, who are by now what used to be called moderate Republicans, uh, they're not far behind. Well, while wealth and power, political power, have very narrowly concentrated, thanks to the vicious cycle, uh, for most people, the real incomes have stagnated uh, for about 30 years. Uh, they've been getting by but with a sharply increased work hours, way beyond Europe now, uh, debt, and uh, asset inflation, uh, which uh, is regularly destroyed by the, the crisis that began as soon as the regulatory apparatus was dismantled. There weren't any as long as the New Deal regu regulatory app apparatus remained in force through the 50s and 60s. Uh, uh, and that's extremely serious. Uh, well, none of this is problematic for the super wealthy. In fact, they benefit from uh, a government insurance policy, which has the name too big to fail. And that's very important. It means the banks and the investment firms, which make virtually no contribution to the actual economy, as far as anyone knows. It's finally beginning to be studied by economists who had looked at it before. Uh, but the banks and the investment firms can make very risky transactions. Make a risky transaction, you get rich rewards. The system's going to crash, inevitably. But when it crashes, they can run to the nanny state, you know, clutching their copies of Hayek and Milton Friedman, and the taxpayer will happily bail them out. That's been the regular process since the Reagan years. And each crisis is more extreme than the last, 
uh, for the public, that is, and the coming crisis, which is almost inevitable, will probably be still worse. Uh, real unemployment in the United States is literally at the level of the Depression for much of the population. Uh, meanwhile, Goldman Sachs, which is one of the main architects of the current crisis, is richer than ever. Just a couple of weeks ago, it quietly announced $17.5 billion in compensation for last year. Uh, CEO Lloyd Blankfein uh, gets $12.5 million bonus, and his base salary was tripled. I should say that he tripled his base salary, because the rules of corporate governments by the government have been designed so that CEOs can pick the panels that set their salaries with obvious consequences. Uh, well, the uh, same thing's happening in England. Just I've been here a couple of days. Every day's front page describes another comparable scandal. Uh, well, it uh, actually wouldn't do to focus attention on such things as these, and accordingly, uh, the propaganda system has to blame others. In the past several months, uh, uh, there's been an interesting propaganda campaign blaming public sector workers, their fat salaries, exorbitant pensions, and so on, all total fantasy. It's on the model of um, Reaganite imagery of, uh, some of you are old enough to recall, of uh, black mothers uh, being driven in their chauffeured limousines to welfare offices to pick the <laughs> checks and so on. Uh, in a culture where lying is honored, you, know, you can get away with this kind of thing. And it has its effects, and there are other models which I need not mention, not very pleasant ones. Uh, the conclusion is we all have to tighten our belts, and not all exactly, some exceptions. Uh, teachers are a particularly good tar target, and they're the ones being targeted now. That's part of a deliberate effort, which I think is going on here too, to destroy the public education system. It means from kindergarten right through the universities uh, by privatization in one form or another. Uh, that's, again, fine for the wealthy. It's a disaster for the population. And it's also a disaster for the long-term health of the economy. Uh, but that's uh, what's called an externality in economic theory. It's something that's put to the side in decision making as long as, insofar as market principles prevail. Well, elections have become, in the United States, almost a complete charade, and other countries are sort of following a couple of decades behind. In the US, by now, they're completely run by the public relations industry. Uh, after his 2008 victory, uh, Obama won an award from the advertising industry for the best marketing campaign of the year. <laughs> And uh, they understood what was going on, you know, no hope and change. Uh, in the business press, like the Financial Times, uh, executives were, were euphoric. Uh, they described that they had been uh, marketing candidates like uh, toothpaste ever since Reagan, and this was the greatest success they'd ever had. They said it would change the style in corporate boardrooms and so on. Uh, the 2012 election is expected to cost uh, $12 billion. That's mostly corporate funding, of course. There's no other source. And it's not surprising that Obama right now is uh, selecting business leaders uh, for top positions. No other way to get the money. The public is very angry and frustrated. But as long as the Muasher principle prevails, it doesn't matter. Well, I've barely skimmed the surface of these critical issues, but I don't want to end without at least mentioning another externality that's dismissed in market systems. Uh, that's the fate of the species. That's an externality as far as decisions are concerned. Uh, system the financial system is plagued, as well understood, by what's called systemic risk. Uh, namely, it's going to crash if it works the way I described. Uh, and systemic risk is problem, but it can be remedied. It can be remedied by the taxpayer. But nobody's going to come to the rescue if uh, the environment is destroyed. Uh, that it must be destroyed is virtually an institutional imperative, and it's worth bearing that in mind. Uh, business leaders in the United States are conducting, openly announcing, that they're conducting uh, massive propaganda campaigns to convince the public that uh, 
anthropogenic global warming is a liberal hoax. The, uh, and it's having an effect, you can see it in polls. Uh, the executives who are running these campaigns know perfectly well that it's not a hoax, it's very grave, uh, but uh, they have no option of following that understanding. Uh, in their institutional role, they must ignore that externality and act to maximize profit and market share. If one of them decides not to do it, he's out, and somebody else is in who does do it. These are properties of the institutions, not the individuals. Uh, and uh, this particularly vicious cycle could well turn out to be lethal. Just to see how grave the danger is, you should have a look at the new Congress in the United States, which is uh, propelled into power by business funding and propaganda. Almost all of them are climate deniers. Uh, they've already begun, begun to cut funding for uh, measures that might mitigate environmental catastrophe, and that's likely all to disappear. Uh, worse still, some of them are true believers. Uh, so, for example, one of the, uh, uh, new, the, heads, the new head of one of the uh, subcommittees on the environment, he explained that, the, that global warming cannot be a problem because God promised Noah that he wouldn't <laughs> have another flood, so that takes care of that problem. Well, we can, you know, if this was happening in some small, remote country, you know, we might laugh, uh, but not when it's happening in the most powerful country in the world. And uh, incidentally, before we laugh, we might also bear in mind that the current economic crisis is traceable in no small measure to a fanatic faith in such dogmas as the efficient market hypothesis, and in general to what uh, Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz, Stiglitz about 15 years ago uh, called the religion that markets know best. Uh, given that dogma, it was unnecessary for the Federal Reserve, you know, the central bank, or for the economics profession with extremely rare exceptions. It was unnecessary to pay attention to the fact that there was an $8 trillion a housing bubble, which had absolutely no relation to any economic fundamentals, I was completely off the course of a hundred years of uh, statistics on this, but you didn't have to notice it uh, because markets know best, so it'll be fine. Of course, it devastated the economy when it burst. Well, all of this is fine, much more can proceed, as long as the Muasher Doctrine prevails as long as the general population is passive, apathetic, diverted to consumerism or to hatred of the vulnerable, then the powerful can do as they like. And uh, those who survive can contemplate the outcome. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you so much. Hi, I'm, I'm Guy, I'm a student here at UCL, and uh, I took part last term in the UCL occupation, along with uh, quite a number of other students <laughs> on here. And, um, uh, you mentioned the, the, the attack on public education in this country and the, the privatisation of education. Uh, we were all very happy to receive a message of support from you last term, uh, which you sent to the occupying students, so I'd just like to say thanks for that, firstly. Um, Secondly, I mean, what we're seeing, I think, is the uh, kick started by the student movement is hopefully what's becoming a much more broad-based movement against austerity in this country, linking up with the trade unions, uh, building to a big demonstration in central London on March 26th. Now, obviously, there's parallels with what's happening in Wisconsin, where there's a, the economic crisis is being used to sort of carry through a politics of wage repression, and you're seeing a fight back against um, that there as well. So I just wanted to ask you, what do you think are the prospects for these uh, kind of uh, emergent movements against uh, austerity? And what do you think the lessons that can be learned from earlier sort of fights for economic justice? Well, you know, in uh, economic theory, there's a name for the policies that Europe is following, England too, uh, namely imposing austerity in the middle of a recession. It's called the Herbert Hoover Principle. Uh, that's exactly what led to the 
world depression. It was uh, reinstated again in 1936 under the advice of under business pressure. It led to another recession. Uh, one well-known economist uh, observed that European leaders might uh, perhaps be charged with violating um, uh, an ethical and, in fact, a legal principle, namely experimentation with human beings cannot be taken without their consent. Okay, This is an experiment to see if the kind of policies which have always been a disaster in the past and which are likely to be a disaster for good reasons again, whether these policies which have humans as their experimental subjects, uh, whether they should be permitted. Well, that's up to people who don't believe in the Moisher doctrine to respond to. As far as education is concerned, I don't really feel qualified to talk about the situation here. You obviously know much more about it than I do. Uh, in the United States, it's quite interesting. As I think I may have mentioned in that letter of support that you, uh, you brought up uh, about, uh, I guess, about a year ago, uh, it, by accident, I happened to be giving some talks in Mexico at the National University, and I went straight from there to California, to the Bay Area, more talk. Uh, these are kind of, you know, they're not the exact opposites in terms of the economy. California should be the richest place in the world. Uh, Mexico is not the poorest country in the world, but it's a pretty poor, poor country. Uh, the National University in Mexico has a couple hundred thousand students at quite a high level. Uh, good facilities, you know, engaged students. Uh, uh, salaries, of course, are much lower than the United States, but it functions quite well. It's free. Uh, the uh, uh, Ten years ago, uh, there was an attempt by the government to raise tuition slightly. There was a student strike, national student strike. The government backed down. It's still free. Okay, that's one of the poorer countries in the world. You go to California, one of the richest places in the world. Uh, it had uh, the greatest public education system in the world. It was uh, excellent. You know. It's being systematically destroyed. This has been going on since the 1970s, very systematically, deliberately, uh, for um, reasons that, in fact, had been articulated. It has nothing to do with economic necessity. These two comparisons should suffice to show that. There are many others like them. So it's not an economic necessity, but other reasons, uh, reasons having to do with the vicious cycle that I described. Uh, and uh, it's having its effects. Uh, next year, for the first year, the public universities, like the great universities, Berkeley, UCLA, and so on, uh, they're getting more of their income from tuition than from the state. And in fact, that's true of most of this State, call it the state universities in the country, Massachusetts too, where I am. Well, these are deliberate policy choices uh, designed, they are designed essentially to privatize the major universities. So very likely the stars in the system like Berkeley and UCLA and uh, maybe San Diego, they'll probably be privatized. They're, they're almost like Ivy League universities today, huge tuition, big endowments and so on. So they'll probably be privatized, and the rest of the system will just uh, shrink. That was a very good system. Uh, and of course, uh, that has uh, dire effects for the future economy. But again, that's an externality. In a, insofar as market systems apply, they do to an extent. You don't consider that. Uh, Short-term gain is what matters. Uh, so that's, and that's happening all over the country. And the same is happening with the public schools. Uh, so there's major pressure, which Obama is contributing to as well, to privatize the public school system, uh, what are called charter schools, which you know, are still paid for by the public, but they're out of the public education system. There's plenty of studies of them. They, they do roughly as well as comparable public schools, even though they have many advantages, like they don't have to run special education programs. Uh, they don't have unionized teachers and so on, but no special performance gains. Uh, and that's a way of uh, undermining public education, uh, which has a kind of a deep purpose behind it. Uh, it's very much like the effort to destroy Social Security. There's a major effort. It's been going on for years. 
to try to destroy the social security system. It's claimed, every, open the newspaper, say you read the New York Times, the editorials will tell you we've got this huge deficit problem. And so we have to uh, deal with uh, entitlements, social security, Medicare and Medicaid, and not waste our energy on other things. Social security contributes zero to the deficit, zero. It comes out of payroll taxes, okay? It's got, first of all, and furthermore, it's pretty well funded for decades in advance, and a little tinkering would fund it forever. But that's uh, gotta be killed. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid, it's true, but the reason for that is something that they won't mention. It's because of the privatized healthcare system, which is extremely inefficient. Now, the U.S. spends about twice as much per capita as every other comparable country uh, on health care, and the outcomes are among the poorest. And if you look at the privatized, unregulated health care system, you can see why. But you're not allowed to touch the financial institutions, the insurance companies, and so on, so that's kind of like off the agenda. Uh, if the United States had a health care system comparable to other industrial countries, uh, not only would there not be a deficit, there'd actually be a surplus. Uh, the about half the deficit in addition to that is military spending. But those things are, you know, off the agenda. You have to go after Social Security. Uh, why Social Security? It's extremely efficient. I mean, administrative costs are practically zero. Uh, but it has a couple of deficiencies. It's no use whatsoever to privilege people. Uh, you know, so you get a, you know, some billionaire gets another small amount of money. It doesn't make any difference. can't even notice it. But it's, it's a sustenance for most of the population, especially those who've been wiped out by the uh, fiscal catastrophe. It doesn't pay that much, but it pays enough to get you by. Uh, pub, uh, beyond that, it has an ideological problem, uh, which is never discussed, but I think it's quite crucial. Uh, it actually has to do with that message from uh, Kamala Abbas to the workers of Wisconsin that I mentioned. Uh, Social Security is based on the principle of solidarity. You're supposed to care if the disabled widow across town has enough food to eat. And that has to be driven out of people's heads. You're supposed to be concerned just about yourself. Same defect in the public education system. Like, I don't have kids in school anymore. So if I follow the rules, I'm not supposed to care if there's a public... I don't want to pay taxes for public education. But if you're infected by this disease of uh, solidarity, you care if a kid across the street can go to school. Now, that's got to be driven out of people's heads. Uh, same reason for the attack on unions. So you get these massive attacks. And I think that's what's happening to the public education system. Uh, you know better than I whether that applies here, but I wouldn't be surprised. Thank you. Another question. Just sir, in the front. Um, thanks a lot for your talk, Professor. You've been a major inspiration for me, so thank you for all your work as well. Um, I did have a question to ask you with regards to um, popular resistance in the Middle East. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, but your position um, re regarding the BDS movement um, uh, is one of ambivalence, or I think you actually oppose certain aspects of it. And if I'm correct, um, it's on the grounds that you feel that if we should be applying that standard to Israel, we should be applying it to American goods as well. And it appears to me that, um, you know, there's a question of feasibility that surely comes into play here. Um, I think it's feasible to, to, to boycott Israeli goods, but, you know, life would be practically unimaginable without American goods. Um, and so I'd like to know, in, 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 in your opinion, how, how you balance that aspect yeah. when you're making your uh, The BDS movement and some of you aren't tuned in, is the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement about Israel. Okay. There is a story that circulates, which is what you repeated, that I'm opposed to it. And that's kind of understandable. That's an interesting, it's an interesting fact about the popular movements. I mean, we kind of live in a Twitter generation where anything that goes beyond 180 characters uh, doesn't exist and can't be understood. <laughs> Uh, literally. Actually, I was involved in the BDS movement before it even crystallized uh, 10 years ago, about five minutes before it started. And I think it's extremely important. Uh, 
I've always supported it. I always advocated it. I still do. But any tac it's a tactic. It's not a principle. And if you're serious about choice of tactics, you ask a couple of questions. The one question you ask is, what's the effect on the victims? It's not the only question, but you certainly have to ask at least that. Well, in some cases, the choice of tactics is helpful to the victims. For example, if the EU, which is a major importer of uh, goods from the settlements, if the EU were to stop importing goods from the Israeli settlements, which are illegal, uncontroversially, if it, and hence participating in illegal acts, if they would do that, it'd be good for the victims. Uh, similarly, if they would follow the uh, advice of Amnesty International and uh, declare an arms embargo on Israel, that'd be good for the victims, uh, even more so for the United States. So these are fine tactics. On the other hand, suppose that you uh, say, I'm going to boycott Tel Aviv University. Well, there's an obvious response that's going to come to that. Uh, why don't you boycott Harvard? Uh, Harvard has a much worse record than Tel Aviv University. And uh, that's going to be the immediate response. And it's unanswerable. You know, it's basically correct. And uh, the effect is that uh, you're giving a gift to hardliners. That's harmful to the victims. You don't pick your tactics in such a way that it's going to be a gift to the most hardline advocates of repression and violence. Uh, that should be automatic. Uh, and you know, these are debates that go on in activist movements all the time. So let's go back to, say, the 1960s. Uh, in, you know, most of you aren't enough, old enough to remember, but some of you are. Uh, in, the United, uh, in the activist movements in the United States in the late 60s, there were groups like the famous weathermen who decided that the way to uh, express their opposition to the war was to go out and uh, break windows and uh, you know, beat people up and so on and so forth. The Vietnamese were very strongly opposed to that. What they advised all the time is to carry out nonviolent tactics. In fact, what they favored, and they said so, was things like uh, you know, women standing quietly in front of uh, the graves of American soldiers. That's what they wanted. Now, those are tactics that help, but they don't make you feel good. It makes you feel good, apparently, if you can go out and break windows of banks. Uh, but uh, as far as the victims are concerned, that's just harmful. All it does is build up support for the war, which is exactly what it did. Uh, so, uh, and, and those questions arise constantly. You have to distinguish feel-good tactics from do-good tactics. If you can't make that distinction, don't even pretend to be involved in solidarity movements. I mean, that's kind of the minimum, you know, then come other questions. And I think those uh, questions arise in the BDS movement too. Unless, if you, you know, they're kind of suppressed in a slogan-based system in which you have a catechism and you repeat it. But if you think about the matter, those questions are always going to arise uh, anywhere. You know, whatever tactical choices you make, and it, you, know, you could have debates about what the consequences are, but at least you have to recognize that those issues arise. And I think that's critical in this case. We have time for a couple more questions. The lady there with the, uh, uh, the yes, you. Hello. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Um, you mentioned the um, the nuclear weapons free zone, uh, as well as the kind of the situation with uh, the military bases in uh, Diego Garcia. Um, but obviously, here in the UK and in the United States, the um, arms companies, defense industry is very closely linked to uh, defense uh, ministries. Um, and I guess my question is, in light of this week, uh, Henry Kissinger saying that deterrence is a useless system, obviously apart from the United States maintaining their nuclear weapons until everyone else gets rid of theirs. Um, I guess in light of Kissinger, who is a very strong voice for previously for military kind of intervention, um, him saying deterrence is a useless system. How does that fit with, say, the US or potentially the UK uh, adhering to their NPT commitments and potentially diminishing the link between uh, the military and uh, defense industries? Well, uh, Kissinger is one of several um, political leaders, uh, George Schultz, the 
uh, former Secretary of State under Reagan, uh, Sam Nunn, who in Congress has been a conservative congressman, but he's, the, he's now out of the Congress. He was the leader and uh, one of the leaders in trying to restrict nuclear weapons proliferation. The three of them and then somebody else, I forgot who, have come up with us repeatedly with statements saying that we should think seriously about honoring our own NPT obligations. The Non-Proliferation Treaty obligates signers, the five nuclear powers who signed it, to carry out good faith efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons entirely. That's Article 6. And uh, uh, this group, uh, Schultz, Kissinger, and others, have said, look, we've got to think about that seriously. Uh, I don't think that the issue for them is deterrence. The issue is elementary rationality. They understand something which we all should understand. As long as nuclear weapons exist, the chances of survival of the human species are quite slight. I mean, there have been repeated occasions over and over <coughs> again when we've come very close to nuclear war. Uh, in fact, we have declassified US records. Uh, the Russian systems are obviously much worse, so whatever is true of us has got to be worse for them. But there are literally dozens of occasions when uh, automated, I mean, the nuclear weapons are on automated response systems. So if you know, automated systems detect uh, something going on somewhere, the computers calculate and you get an order, fire the weapons. There are literally dozens of cases where it came up to within a couple of minutes of sending off nuclear missiles. It was aborted by human intervention. Okay, that's the US side. Russian side undoubtedly is a lot worse because they don't have the systems are no good and so on. Well, you know, that's just playing with fire. Sooner or later, there's not going to be a human intervention. Furthermore, there are explicit cases where we've come literally within instance of, instance of nuclear war. I mean, the most extreme case, which should really be studied carefully, is 1962, the missile crisis. That's been intensively investigated now uh, for one reason, because the people involved, like Robert McNamara and others, they recognized how crazy it was uh, Arthur Schlesinger was in the government and called it the most dangerous moment in human history. Uh, there was actually a, a moment there when one Russian submarine commander uh, prevented what could have been a nuclear war. Uh, at one point in the missile crisis, uh, uh, Kennedy had uh, established an embargo of Cuba. Uh, you know, no ships could come within a certain distance and Russian ships were approaching that line. There were also, it turned, nobody knew it at the time, but there were Russian submarines there which had nuclear-tipped missiles. Uh, they were attacked by U.S. destroyers, depth charges, and the commanders of the uh, submarines, who had authority to fire nuclear missiles, the same is true of U.S. systems, uh, they, uh, they thought a war had started. Uh, there were three commanders, two of them, uh, decided to send off the missiles. Okay, the third, uh, Vasily Arkhipov, who should get 20 Nobel Peace Prizes, <laughs> he, uh, he uh, rejected the order. And they had to have uh, uh, all three agreeing so they didn't fire them. I mean, if they'd fired, uh, these are not nuclear, you know, big, huge nuclear weapons, but if they'd fired nuclear-tipped missiles, uh, the U.S. reaction we know from the internal plans was, you know, they do something like that. We take out Moscow, they take out London, and then there it goes on from that. You should read the studies that we know what they were. Came that close. Actually, there was another moment in the missile crisis which amazingly is described as one of John F. Kennedy's great achievements. I mean, in my view, it's one of the worst crimes in human history. But what happened, the facts are known and not debated. At a peak moment of the missile crisis, you know, just coming to its peak, uh, Khrushchev uh, wrote a letter to Kennedy in which he offered a way to end it. Uh, the offer was that uh, Russia would remove the uh, missiles from Cuba and in return the United States would remove uh, missiles in Turkey 
Now, the missiles in Turkey are much more of a threat to Russia than the missiles in Cuba were to the United States, but that's the usual asymmetry. We're allowed to do things that others can't do. Now, Kennedy was kind of surprised when he got that letter because he had already given an order to withdraw the, the missiles from Turkey because they were obsolete. They were being replaced by much more destructive Polaris submarines in the Mediterranean. So he, had a, he pointed out at the in internal discussion, this is going to be a hard offer to refuse. You know, it's not going to sell in Peoria the way it's put. But uh, he decided to refuse it, uh, uh, be, just to preserve the macho image and to show that we run things. So uh, in fact, they did withdraw the missiles from Turkey, but uh, secretly. Uh, that was part of the process of humiliating Khrushchev. And to reach that goal, he was willing to face what he himself considered a probability of about one a third of nuclear war. I mean, these are what goes on. These are things that go on in the minds of uh, you know the, the best and the brightest, as they call themselves. Just think of the rest. Well, Kissinger, Schultz, and others have been right in the middle of this. And they know that we're on the verge of catastrophe. So they're saying, look, we've got to do something to get rid of this uh, destructive capacity. This really doesn't have to do with deterrence so much. Uh, I mean, as far as deterrence is concerned, there are, there are interesting discussions. But one of the most interesting is a very important book uh, written by uh, one of Israel's leading strategic analysts, a guy named Zev Maoz. It's in English. It's, uh, I think it's called Defending the Holy Land. Uh, he goes through, it's about you know, a thousand pages of detailed analysis of uh, Israel's strategic objectives since 1948. And he's very judicious. He gives the arguments on both sides. It's careful. He knows what he's talking about. And his basic conclusion is that uh, uh, Israel's policies have been selected in ways which harm its security. Actually, that's not unusual. That's true of the policies of most states, including Britain and the United States. So if you bother to look at the Chilcot inquiry, you'll have noticed that uh, the head of British intelligence testified that uh, when they decided to go to war against Iraq, it was on the assumption that it would sharply increase te the terrorist risk to Britain. And she points out that the CIA had the same assumption. Okay, we already sort of knew that from other sources, but this is the highest level confirmation. And that's correct, and they decided to go ahead anyway. And the reason is the security of the people of Britain and the United States is not a high priority for planners. It's a low priority. There's plenty of evidence for that. Uh, other countries are similar. Uh, well, in the case of Israel, that's his conclusion. When he gets to nuclear, he has a chapter on nuclear weapons, which is worth reading. And he argues, I think, pretty judiciously and convincingly that Israel's nuclear weapons program has harmed its security. Gives a good argument. And uh, if security were the top concern, I think that argument would be taken seriously. Now, it's that kind of consideration that Kissinger and the others have in mind. You know, Kissinger, and these, especially these guys have worked all their lives on deterrence theory, and they understand that this does not contribute to security. And in fact, it does contribute very likely to long-term, maybe not so long-term destruction. Incidentally, not so long-term, if you've taken a look at WikiLeaks, and most of it doesn't tell you much, but there are things that do tell you some interesting things. Now, some of the most important have to do with Pakistan. The uh, American ambassador in Pakistan, Ambassador Patterson, uh, she, she was regularly warning Washington that uh, U.S. actions in Afghanistan, which she incidentally approved of, but she was warning them that these actions are uh, having a dangerous effect in Pakistan. They're contributing to the possible fracture of Pakistan and its uh, radicalization. Now, you have to, re uh, the reason is that, you know, like drone, uh, for, uh, public opinion in Pakistan is overwhelmingly hostile to the United States. Uh, the military doesn't like what we're doing. They're being humiliated, you know. Uh, when, they're, when the U.S. urges them to attack the tribal areas, now, that's interfering with their prerogatives, and they don't like it. They know it's not the thing to do. Uh, the drone attacks are the same. And what she was arguing is that, uh, was warning Washington, the cables, that uh, these actions in Afghanistan and Pakistan 
are threatening the stability of Pakistan. Now, Pakistan is a very dangerous country, it's the most dangerous place in the world. Now, Pakistan has a huge nuclear weapon system, which is expanding rapidly. It's expanding more rapidly than any other country in the world. It's, uh, it, it has a radical Islamic element, which isn't a majority, but it's real. You know, if you remember when uh, Salam Qasir was assassinated a couple of months ago uh, for you know, objecting to the blasphemy laws, uh, there was strong support for the assassins. And it wasn't just from the you know, tribes. It was if you, in the pictures in the newspapers showed uh, uh, black suited lawyers, young lawyers, uh, demonstrating in support of the assassins. Now, those are the same lawyers who were demonstrating to overthrow the Musharraf dictatorship. They're the reformists. But they were uh, demonstrating in support of the assassins. All right, these are all consequences of actions that were taken in the Reagan administration uh, with two, two clear consequences. One was to allow Pakistan, to help Pakistan develop nuclear weapons. Uh, Reagan was supporting Zia al-Haq, the most awful of the series of awful dictators in Pakistan. And the US pretended they didn't know that he was developing nuclear weapons so they could keep supporting it. Of course he was. Uh, the other was radical Islamization, uh, with uh, 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 Saudi funding. Uh, 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 Azia was uh, carrying out a program of changes in the educational system, his famous uh, madrasas in which people only study the Quran and become jihadis. And so on. That was all going on from the 80s. It's extended. It's now had a big effect. So you now have a situation with a radical Islamist movement, nuclear weapons, you're provoking the military, the only stable force in the region, which might crack Punjabi mostly, you know, a lot of problems. Uh, and it might, she warns, lead to uh, fissile materials leaking into the hands of jihadis. Those are our actions in Afghanistan. Okay, there's actually an interesting article by, just came out a couple of weeks ago in a journal called The National Interest, kind of conservative National Affairs Journal in the U.S. by uh, Anatoly Yevin, who's one of the specialists on Pakistan, in which he goes through a lot of this. And his conclusion is that uh, uh, the U.S. and British soldiers are dying in Afghanistan to make the world more dangerous for the United States and Britain. Well, if you think it through, that's probably what's happening. So yeah, that's uh, it's right in front of our eyes, going on right now. The U.S. and Britain are continuing, are contributing to it, and it's not unusual. I mean, it's a striking fact if you look over history that state actions are often taken with the understanding that they may very well harm security. You take a look at the history of wars; uh, those who started the wars very often lose them uh, with uh, disastrous consequences, and uh, you know, it, it's taken into account because they're higher priorities. Uh, and I think uh, that's the kind of thing that uh, this group you're talking about has in mind. Uh, and I think basically they're right, and we should take it seriously. Well, I think on that note, sober and sobering as it was, we must uh, end this evening. I invite you all to retire to the Jeremy Bentham Room in the main part of college uh, for some refreshments, if uh, to lighten one's spirits and also to digest some of the profundity that we've heard this evening. But I would also like you all to thank, me, thank uh, Professor Chomsky again for his speech.